Yeah, so I will give a survey lecture about surgery borders and scalar curvature. And then uh, in the second part of our today's seminar, um, we will have a second talk by Johannes Ebert from Münster, who will um, then talk about a more recent research results. Um, to give a start, I would like to, let's see. Okay, so let me just give a gentle start and uh, remind you of some um, examples of flexibility in geometry. And then uh, when it goes on in, during my talk, I will then um, more move into the direction of um, uh, uh, geometric topology. And then actually it will have a, sort, a certain different flavor, but the, the actual source of all these developments uh, is in the flexibility um, in geometry. So we have the Nash-Kuiper result, uh, which says that um, uh, if you have a, a short smooth embedding of a Riemannian manifold in Euclidean space of dimension at least one higher, then this can be C0 approximated by isometric embeddings, which are C1 and uh, C2 or higher irregularities, of course, not possible. Uh, so these are some famous pictures which illustrate that. And then uh, Misha proved that uh, for non-connected, uh, for, for non-compact manifolds, which are connected, uh, there are no global curvature restrictions. This is uh, the famous H principle. It's also an, uh, an example of a flexibility phenomenon. And together with Christian Baer, I proved um, uh, um, a flexibility result uh, or existence result, uh, which is of a very general nature of C11 regular metrics. So this is just a little below C2, um, uh, uh, of any kind on open dense subsets uh, on smooth manifolds. So uh, there are C11 regular metrics such that there are no curvature restrictions on open dense subsets of some given manifold V. So these are just general flexibility examples. And now let me uh, turn to scalar curvature. Um, and here on this slide, we have some examples uh, in green and in red. Uh, which actually, so or, or some of them already occurred in some recent talks and some uh, will occur in my talk or in uh, later talks. Um, namely, uh, we can ask if is the scalar curvature, this curvature notion, geometric notion, is it flexible or rigid? So to, do we have the possibility to, to, to uh, deform things easily or are there obstructions to a certain to, to realizing certain uh, kinds of uh, uh, restrictions on scalar curvature. And so I would like to start with a flexibility result by Lohkamp from 1995. Namely, uh, this says that if you look at the space of all uh, Riemannian metrics with a certain upper scalar curvature bound C, then uh, this subspace is actually C0 dense in all C infinity metrics. So every Riemannian metric can C0 approximated by a metric with some um, given upper scalar curvature bound. And this is actually the reason why it's more interesting to look for um, uh, restrictions for metrics with lower scalar curvature bounds. And uh, so then uh, we have a rigidity result, which actually was all already mentioned in some previous talks, namely that if you look at all metrics which have a lower scalar curvature bound, then this subspace is actually C0 closed in all C infinity metrics. So if we have a sequence of uh, C infinity metrics which converges C0 to another C infinity metric, then lower scalar curvature bounds uh, are preserved. Then uh, some existence and non-existence results in the second square. Um, so we have a um, very general existence result of Gromov and Lawson um, for um, non-spin simply connected manifolds of dimension at least five. We have the existence of positive scalar curvature metrics um, in dimension at least five. And uh, then on the contrary, uh, there are interesting obstructions to positive scalar curvature metrics, for example, on exotic spheres. This is um, a very interesting phenomenon was um, uh, um, investigated by Nigel Hitchin in 1974 in his uh, famous paper about harmonic spinners. And then we have another result which uh, bears a lot of names, 
Hitchin, Grom of Lawson, Carl, um, then myself, Schick Steimle, Crowley Schick, Botwinnik, Eva Randall Williams, Perlmutter. And this uh, gives a um, kind of a conclusive result about uh, a non triviality of higher homotopic groups, pi k, of the space of positive scalar curvature metrics. And here I restrict on the n sphere of dimension at least five. And this tells us that in all dimensions where we have a possible or potential index theoretic invariant, which may be non-trivial, and this can be realized on the space of positive scalar curvature metrics. So we have, non, uh, we have many non-trivial higher homotopic groups of spaces of positive scalar curvature metrics. And uh, recently, together with uh, Christian Baer, I proved a flexibility result um, concerning uh, boundary conditions for scalar curvature. And then on the contrary, we have a rigidity result uh, telling us that if we um, are on the end disk, we look at non-negative scalar curvature metrics, which restrict to the standard metric on the boundary and um, are mean uh, and have a, a mean curvature, at least the one of a sphere of an n minus one sphere, then this must be actually isometric to the stand, standard metric. So this is a um, rigidity result. Uh, some of which we have already seen in previous talks. And let me just tell you what this boundary condition for scalar curvature is. This is um, a quite recent result, and therefore I would like to mention it. Namely, uh, we look at a smooth manifold with um, compact boundary. Let's take a constant C. And then we look at uh, the space of, of uh, metrics with scalar curvature bound below by C. And the mean curvature along the boundary is non-negative. So these are mean convex um, uh, metrics of positive scalar curvature. And here we have uh, metrics of positive scalar curvature whose second fundamental form along the boundary is zero. So this means totally geodesic boundary. And then we have a theorem whose formulation will be similar to the formulation of other theorems that we will see in the, uh, on, uh, on the next slides. Namely, we look at the space of metrics, this means R for Riemannian, look at those Riemannian metrics with a scalar curvature bounded below by C, and then we have mean convex boundary. And here we have a subspace with a stronger boundary condition, namely with totally geodesic boundary. And uh, so we can look at the um, canonical inclusion here, and the statement is that this is a weak homotopy equivalence. Uh, so weak homotopy equivalence means that uh, it induces isomorphisms in all homotopy groups, but it is for this talk enough to think of actual homotopy equivalences. So this means basically that whenever you have a metric in the larger space, or if you have a family of such metrics, then you can deform these metrics to metrics which lie in the uh, smaller space. So you can preserve the lower scalar curvature bound and improve the boundary condition from mean convex to totally geodesic. So this is a typical kind of flexibility result in scalar curvature geometry. And here we are talking about um, uh, boundary conditions. So similar results we have for other boundary conditions. And um, so there are previous results uh, going in a sim similar direction. And now uh, let me explain you the, what the surgery theorem tells us. And this is exactly the, the border between- um, can, I, can I ask a question? Yes, you can ask. So in, on, on the previous slide, do you have to assume it's strictly greater or can it be e greater in, or equal to? You mean here, the scalar curvature? Yeah. Yeah, so, so um, during the deformation, the scalar curvature may decrease a little bit. But how much? It's up to you. But um, uh, so for this result, we cannot. So um, in our result, we cannot say scalar larger than or equal, because during our deformation, the scalar curvature will be decreased a little. I see. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. So uh, the surgery theorem is exactly at the border between uh, the geometric intuition of flexibility, and then it opens a big world um, pointing into um, geometric topology. And because we have very powerful results in this area, uh, this will lead to very powerful and um, amazing results in scalar curvature geometry. So the basic result is the following. Um, we take an embedded sphere 
with um, trivialized normal bundle in our smooth manifold V. And uh, then let's take the upper hemisphere in a standard sphere. It's just uh, the upper hemisphere with the induced metric. It's a half, half sphere. And we call a Riemannian metric um, on V adapted to this embedded sphere if in the normal direction, if the normal exponential map induces an isometric diffeomorphism of the product um, SD cross this upper hemisphere together with um, so uh, um, isometric diffeomorphism to the normal bundle of radius pi half around SD. So here I should have written SD. Okay, so these are metrics in standard form around an embedded sphere. And um, then I can look at the space of positive scalar curvature metrics, which are adapted near SD or adapted to SD. So which are of this very special form. And then we can again look at the um, canonical inclusion and this flexibility theorem here, the surgery theorem tells us that this is a weak homotopy equivalence as long as the co-dimension of the embedded sphere is at least three. Again, this means that if you have such a metric, then you can uh, deform the metric through positive scalar curvature metrics into a very specific shape around SD without leaving the world of positive scalar curvature metrics. So it's again, a flexibility result. And um, so uh, you see that somehow here, the names of Gromov laws and Xun Yao are missing, but uh, this will be done on the next slide. Actually, this formulation here is due to um, Geyer from 1993. And the full statement that this is a weak homotopy equivalence is a paper by Chernish in 2004. And we have an analogous statements for other um, so-called surgery stable curvature conditions, which I will not talk about right now. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. We can always achieve a very specific form near an embedded sphere. And now we can do a lot with that because uh, this opens the way to apply surgery in this situation. And this is exactly what happens on the slide. Uh, so this is the first main application. Namely, we can compare spaces of positive scalar curvature metrics. So um, we are given a manifold V N again, and uh, we assume that V hat is obtained from V by a surgery along an embedded sphere SD. Surgery means uh, we have um, a trivialized, trivialized normal bundle. We remove um, the disk bundle of the normal bundle around V, and then we glue in a new manifold with the same boundary as the one that we removed earlier. So the boundary is SD cross SN minus D minus one. And here the boundary is SD cross SN minus D minus one. This is the surgery step um, in geometric topology. And uh, so now we can uh, use the previous result to prove to um, or this very interesting statement here due to common flaws and Shun Yao, namely if the coda measure is at least three and V admits a positive scalar curvature metric, then also V hat admits a positive scalar curvature metric. And um, if both surgeries, so the so we say that N minus D is the co-dimension of the surgery sphere. But if we have such a surgery going from V to V hat, then we can apply the inverse surgery going from V hat to V. And then uh, the co-dimension of that surgery will be D plus one. And if both surgeries going back and forth are at least three, then actually the, the two spaces are homotopy equivalent. So this is a stronger statement. So it's not just an existence statement, but we um, have a stronger statement about the nature of these two spaces. And let me just give a one line proof of the first, uh, of the second statement and the first statement is similar. So how does this work? Um, let's say uh, we are interested in the space of positive scalar curvature metrics on V, then up to homotopy, we can assume that all these metrics are of standard 
form near SD. So have a very specific form, namely there are a product metric on SD cross a cap. And actually then we can remove this this, this handle with a um, standard metric, glue in the uh, mirror handle for the surgery, also with a standard metric. And this gives us exactly uh, then a metric of positive scalar curvature on V hat, which is adapted to the dual surgery sphere. And then we can again use uh, the um, homotopy equivalence given by the inclusion of the adaptive metric to the full space of metrics. Okay, so, and the proof of the first statement is, um, is actually the same, but of course the second statement is uh, uh, a lot stronger because we are comparing spaces and we are not just proving an existence result. Okay, so um, up to now, it's pretty, uh, I would say intuitive what's going on because we know exactly what surgery means uh, and we can believe, we can kind of uh, think within our head what it means to deform a metric near a surgery sphere and then uh, replace it by, um, by this dual handle in order to perform the surgery. So far, so good. But now um, we have the borders and theorem. And from this point onwards, the story becomes, so, uh, actually attains a different flavor it becomes much less geometric, at least for our intuition. And, but on the other hand, uh, we can use a very powerful and strong results from geometric topology. And I think it's one of the, the wonders kind of in, in our field that um, during the times 80s and 90s of the last century, um, there were so powerful results available in geometric topology, which were uh, developed previously in the 60s and 70s. And so these two branches then could be combined in a very efficient way, namely by this uh, surgery theorem due to um, Gormov and Lawson. So it's a very existent, it's a very um, general existence result uh, for positive scalar curvature metrics. Namely, uh, let's take a simply connected closed manifold of dimension at least five. So the whole story concerns manifolds of high dimension, at least five and lower dimensions, the world is a little different because then the surgery theory doesn't work so well anymore. But in these dimensions, at least five, uh, we know that if V is a spin manifold and spin bordered to a manifold admitting a positive scalar curvature metric, then V itself admits a positive scalar curvature metric. Let me remind you what um, borders means. This means that we have a manifold of one dimension higher um, and its boundary um, is a disjoint union of V and V hat, right? And this, then we say these two manifolds are bordered. And if we require that the big manifold um, is a spin manifold, then we say it's, so these two manifolds are spin bordered. Okay, so in the V does not admit a spin structure and is oriented bordered to a closed manifold admitting a positive scalar curvature metric then the given manifold admits a positive scalar curvature metric. Okay, so this is um, a sort of reformulation of the previous result, but in a different language. What's going on? Right, so under each of these conditions, it turns out that V can be obtained from V hat by a sequence of surgeries of co-dimension at least three. And this uses um, the handle cancellation technique, uh, which was uh, used earlier um, in the proof of the H. Cobordison theorem. And um, yeah, right, so, so it here it's, can be used very efficiently to prove such an existence result, but it's not very explicit because if we have a, board, a bordism between two manifolds, it's in general not at all clear how a handle decomposition going from one manifold to the other looks like. It's just an abstract existence result, but we have, on the other hand, very powerful techniques to decide whether two manifolds are bordered or not. And this makes these results very interesting from um, geometric topological point of view. So let me just um, give to, in order to uh, give a complete picture, 
um, uh, a, a general formulation of the Bordeson theorem, namely you may wonder why you have to use in one case the spin Bordeson and in the other case the oriented Bordeson. So this is a little tricky actually in the story and it's a little confusing I would say. But the, uh, there is a general formulation and this uses the language of theta structure. So these are refinements of uh, tangential structures. Um, I don't want to go deeply into it, but I just would like to mention it so that you know what the state of the art really is. Namely, uh, let's take the classifying space of vector bundles of dimension um, n plus one, and let's look at a vibration over this classifying space. So for example, we could look at B spin n plus one, so then uh, uh, maps into this B spin space would be would give spin structures on an oriented vector bundle and so on. But this language or this notion is more general. We can also look at uh, the product of B spin and also the fundamental group of some manifold W, right? And uh, then just uh, taking the projection in the first factor to B O N plus one, we again have a vibration over the space. So then we can take the um, uh, tautological vector bundle of dimension n plus one over B O n plus one, and we call a theta structure on W. It's a kind of general kind of refinement of uh, the um, given tangential structure of W is, um, is a bundle map, a, a vector bundle map. Namely, uh, we have a map from W to B and um, here each fiber of the tangent space is uh, mapped isomorphically to the fiber of this pulled back vector bundle, pulled back via the map theta. So here we can pull back the tautological bundle uh, uh, along theta, we get a bundle over B, and uh, we, uh, we require that we have a, a map of vector bundles here. And then um, we have a very general formulation of the Bordeson theorem uh, due to Ebert and Frank. You can look at this paper in, on the archive, and it's also published already. Namely, um, we have a natural notion of theta Bordeson and um, theta manifolds, which are introduced here. And then we see if um, one inclusion of V1 into this um, classifying space is too connected, it means it induces uh, bijections on pi zero and pi one and, an, and a surjection on pi two then um, each metric of positive scalar curvature on V0 induces a metric on the other boundary component, V1. And actually we have a map between spaces of positive scalar curvature metrics. And if these two um, uh, uh, um, structure maps are too connected, then again, these two spaces are homotopy equivalent. So this is a general situation, a, a general formulation, and this applies to all kinds of manifolds, spin, non-spin, connected or non, uh, uh, simply connected or non-simply connected. And for example, if we take V0 and V1 simply connected and spin, and spin bordered, which was on the previous slide, then uh, for B, we just take B spin n plus one, and this theorem um, then gives us the previous theorem on the previous slide. Namely that in this case, these two spaces are homotopy equivalent, which uh, can be deduced from Chernish result. And um, okay, so from the Bordeson theorem, we can do another rather large step using the classification of the computation of Bordeson groups, uh, which was achieved in the 60s. And it was really one of the enormous great achievements in geometric topology, um, going back to Tom and then a lot of other people later. Um, namely, uh, let's take a simply connected manifold of dimension at least five. And so as already cited on the, on the uh, second slide, if V does not admit a spin structure, then V admits a positive scalar curvature metric. And if V does admit a spin structure, then we have an obstruction, which is um, uh, due to index theory. It's a refinement of the head genus, and uh, this is called the alpha invariant of Hitchin. And if this is zero, then V actually admits a metric of positive scalar curvature. If alpha of V is not zero, 
then Hitchin already proved that uh, this is an obstruction to positive scalar curvature metrics uh, by index theory and the Lichnihovich formula. And uh, so the proof uses the Bordeson theorem together with uh, very interesting computation due to Stefan Stolz from 1992. He proves that if V is a spin manifold with vanishing Hitchin alpha, then V is actually spin bordened to the total space of an HP2 bundle. HP2 is the quaternionic uh, projective space. It's an eight dimensional manifold which admits a metric of positive scalar curvature. And if you have the total space of such a bundle, then by shrinking the fibers, the total space also admits a positive scalar curvature metric. And then using the uh, um, Bordeson theorem, we can conclude that, uh, yeah, so V itself must admit a positive scalar curvature using the Bordeson theorem. And for the non spin case, we can either use an explicit computation or explicit list of generators of the um, oriented Bordeson ring, or we can use another computation which is analogous, a little easier than the one of Stolz. Um, it's a former student of mine, Sven Führing, in 2008. In his diploma thesis, he proved that um, if you have uh, a non spin manifold, um, then V is oriented board into the total space of a CP2 bundle. Actually, this is not quite, it's not stated correctly here. So um, it's independent whether F V admits a spin structure or not. So every um, oriented manifold is oriented board into the total space of such a bundle. Okay, so in the non-simply connected case, uh, the situation is far less understood. And for example, I refer to the previous talk by um, uh, Schmuel Weinberger and Guliang Yu, uh, which showed us that uh, there are powerful techniques using uh, K theory of C star algebras. And uh, then we, uh, we enter the world of the Novikov conjecture, which is, um, I would say, largely unexplored. I mean, we have very interesting results, but there are still very interesting questions that are un unanswered so far. And uh, now let me um, go back to the space of positive scalar curvature metrics. Again, it's not just existence, but we compare the spaces of such metrics. And here we have a quite interesting result due to young Bernard Cordas from the um, just two years ago. Namely, he proved that the spaces of positive scalar curvature metrics on the four dimensional 4K dimensional sphere is homotopy equivalent to the space of positive scalar curvature metrics on HPK, the um, 4K dimensional quaternionic projective space. This is quite amazing since these two spaces are not spin broadened. It's quite, uh, quite a surprise, I would say. For me, it was a surprise to see such a result. And the trick is, that we can, um, it's an observation due to Cordas, that actually the um, surgery theorem can be generalized to adapted metrics around submanifolds, which are more general than just spheres, and who may also um, be non, have non-trivial normal bundles. So we need not require that uh, uh, the normal bundles are trivial. So actually, so the surgery theorem can then be proved be proved in a pretty much the same way as before. But now we can derive a, such an interesting result by observing that um, in HPK, you can look at HPK minus one. It's a submanifold in here. And if you look at the normal bundle, it's of course non-trivial. But if you remove the disk bundle of the normal bundle, then the complement is just a 4K disk. And hence, you can remove this part and glue in a complementary disk, 4K disk, and you get the 4K sphere. So it's a generalized sort of surgery, I would say. And uh, here, this still um, gives us the possibility to, uh, uh, to compare these two spaces. But really, on the level of surgery, or this more generalized surgery, rather than on the level of Bordeson. And uh, then um, starting from this result, you can prove a um, much more general result, namely, if you have a simply connected spin manifold of dimension at least five with vanishing 
alpha genus so that we have um, at least one positive scalar curvature metric, then the space of positive scalar curvature metrics on V is homotopy equivalent to the space of positive scalar curvature metrics on the n-sphere. And this is quite interesting because um, before we had such a result, there was a possibility that by studying spaces of positive scalar curvature metrics on manifolds, we may derive interesting invariants about the underlying manifolds themselves. But with such a result, this says uh, this is impossible because at least in the simply connected case, um, different manifolds cannot be distinguished by looking at their spaces of positive scalar curvature metrics up to homotopy. So the only space which is of interest, uh, which is of interest to us is the space of positive scalar curvature metrics on the n-sphere, if we are interested in the homotopy type of such spaces. So this is the universal space in this respect. And um, OK, so the key idea is that you combine this observation with um, the Stoltz technology. You look at, the um, at HP2 bundles, which um, give all kinds of borders and classes with vanishing alpha genus. And then in these fibers, you can apply this construction. right? You can more or less replace each fiber by an eight sphere by applying this construction fiber-wise. And then we have such a uh, quite amazing result. Okay, so let me then uh, come to um, uh, the space of positive scalar curvature metrics on the, on the n sphere. Um, on the previous slide, we saw that this is the, the case which uh, is of the main interest to us. And then we have um, a non-triviality result for the um, higher homotopy groups of spaces of positive scalar curvature metrics on the n-sphere. Namely, there is a general construction which is due to Hitchin. It's called the index difference map. It maps from the um, space of positive scalar curvature metrics to, uh, so the index difference then gives an induced um, yeah, K theory class, real K theory. This is what we are using here. And this gives us uh, then a map from the K homotopy group of the space to um, the um, uh, coefficients of real K theory in dimension K plus N plus one, right? If K is zero, then we are in dimension N plus one. And this is a case which was already studied by Hitchin. Okay, so these coefficients here, the, uh, they are equal to z in dimensions um, divisible by four. They are equal to z modulo two in dimensions uh, or uh, for k plus n plus one equal one or two modulo eight and zero otherwise. And so now we can ask the question if this index difference map is surjective or not. So can the invariants which appear here either z or z2 or zero, can they be realized by certain interesting homotopy classes within that space? And this is actually possible. This is what this result tells us. And uh, as you could see on the previous slide, um, there were partial results going in the same direction by very many people. I do not want to repeat all the names, but this is kind of the most general formulation of such a result, and it's also the strongest result because it uh, says that we really have um, uh, surjective, surjectivity of this map. Okay, but Winnick, Ebert, Randall, Williams proved this for n at least six for n equals five, it's uh, due to Perlmutter. And I would like to uh, present a construction of these homotopy classes using a technique um, uh, from a paper of myself, Schick and Steimler from 2014. And um, so that's quite explicit. You can see it on the next slide, but it only applies to the case if N is large compared to K, right? So this is what um, uh, um, uh, Thomas and Wolfgang and myself did in 2014. We proved a similar result in this case, in the case where k plus n plus one is uh, divisible by four, but we uh, had to assume in addition that n 
is large compared to K. And um, so this, this full result on the slide, this um, uses a completely different proof technique from ours. Uh, it uses uh, quite interesting developments in uh, more recent geometric topology. So the, the key word is cobordism categories and the classification of diffeomorphism type of, of manifolds using this very um, powerful technique, uh, which was developed during the last 15 years or so in geometric topology. But OK, so um, let me construct these non-zero classes and higher homotopy groups of spaces of positive scalar curvature matrix on the n-sphere. The key ingredient is the following. Um, if n is large compared to k, we have an explicit bound, actually. And if we are in the case that d plus n plus 1 is divisible by 4, there are fiber bundles over the k plus 1 sphere whose total space has non-trivial a hat genus. And the total space is also spin. This is quite amazing because the a hat genus is not multiplicative in such high fiber bundles, contrary to the signature. So the signature of such a total space would be zero because it's the, the product of the signature of base and fiber. But in the a hat genus, this is not the case. Uh, but on the other hand, it was before we wrote this paper, actually unknown if there are examples of this kind where the total space has a non-trivial a hat genus. And we can also um, realize it in such a way that the fiber is a spin boundary. And now, um, as we learn it in kind of uh, elementary classes in, um, in, in bundle theory, we write the total space in terms of a clutching construction. Namely, we divide the base into two halves, the upper and lower hemisphere, over which the bundle is trivial. And then we glue together these two parts using a clutching map, phi, which is defined on the equator of sk plus 1 is sk, and it goes to the diffeomorphisms of f. And um, also, since f is a spin boundary, uh, we have a metric of positive scalar curvature, this general existence result of a previous slide. Using this clutching map, we can uh, then fabricate a homotopy class. Namely, we can just map each point of SK to the metric G0 on F pulled back along the diffeomorphism phi evaluated on Xi. So phi is a map from SK to diff. Phi of Xi is a diffeomorphism and we pull back G0 along this diffeomorphism. This gives a map from SK to the space. And I claim that the induced homotopy class is different from zero. And then you can use bordism invariance of the space or the general result by um, uh, Ebert and Wiemeller um, to, to compare these two spaces. OK, let's assume that this is homotopic to a constant map. Then we look at the parameterized mapping cylinder of um, this family of diffeomorphisms. Why parameterized mapping cylinder? OK, for each psi, you get a mapping cylinder by gluing 0, 1 cross f along the two boundaries. So 0, f will be um, identified with 1 phi of psi f. But uh, we do this for any parameter psi. And therefore, we have an additional factor sk. There's a parameterized mapping cylinder construction. So we glue together the, the two ends. And this admits a metric, a fiberwise metric of positive scalar curvature, actually, if we assume that this, uh, this family is homotopic to the constant family, because then we can, before gluing this thing together, adapt the matrix in each fiber so that uh, the two metrics match at the gluing region. And so we can uh, make sure that in this non trivial fiber bundle, each fiber carries a metric of positive scalar curvature, assuming that this uh, family of pulled back metrics is homotopic to a constant family. And hence, by shrinking the fibers, we see that uh, the space of positive scalar curvature metrics on N must be non-trivial, non-empty, so we have at least one metric. But these two manifolds are spin-bordant, 
that's quite easy to see. Does this parameterized mapping cylinder is spin bordered to P. So the dimension of the base manifolds is more or less equal. And you just have to uh, play a little bit around with these two constructions. But then we get a contradiction here. And uh, you see that on this slide, we are not so much using any surgery theorem or anything like that, but it's the old fashioned classical a head obstruction, which is used here. But in order to compare two spaces, like uh, the space for F and the space for SN, we uh, use uh, the surgery and the borders and techniques. Okay, so this means that we have higher homotopy classes, higher non-trivial homotopy classes in this space. And now let me uh, uh, say a few words about modular spaces of positive scalar curvature metrics. Namely, uh, we can look at the space of positive scalar curvature metrics and observe that the diffeomorphism group acts by pullback on that space. The quotient is uh, called the moduli space of positive scalar curvature metrics on V. And uh, I would say for technical reasons, it's not a very good excuse, but this is what we uh, can do here, is we um, yes, see the problem is that this diffeomorphism group is not acting freely on the space of Riemannian metrics, but there is a smaller group, a certain subgroup, namely the group of diffeomorphisms, fixing a point and acting as the identity on the tangent space. This is what we call the observer moduli, uh, the observer diffeomorphism group, fixing an observer. And this group acts freely on the space of Riemannian metrics as long as V is um, connected. And therefore, um, we uh, look at this uh, quotient here. So we quotient out a, a, a um, slightly um, smaller group, this is called the observer moduli space of positive scalar curvature metrics. Let me now just cite two results going in the direction, kind of marking the state of the art, uh, what we uh, know here. Namely, on the previous slide, I constructed um, non-trivial higher homotopy classes of the space of positive scalar curvature metrics on SN. And now if you pass to the quotient, in the observer moduli space, and these classes survive this process. And this is quite interesting. It's, it looks almost contradictory because when we go back um, to the previous slide, the construction of these classes was by a pullback construction along uh, a family of diffeomorphisms. And this means that the, um, the homotopy class, which we see here for trivial reasons is killed by passing through the uh, observer moduli space. But once we apply borders and invariance, which says, okay, these two spaces are equal, but the action of the diffeomorphism group of, of SN is different here. And here we can pass through the observer moduli space without killing these classes. This is quite interesting. And uh, we also have a result uh, concerning the full moduli space, namely for any Q, there exist examples of closed manifolds such that the full moduli space dividing out the full uh, diffeomorphism group with all its non-trivial stabilizers and so on um, has a non-trivial uh, homotopic group in, di in degree 4q, even with rational coefficients. And for example, what we do not know is if these classes, which I uh, constructed on the previous slide, observe to the homotopic groups of the full moduli space. So there are lots of questions which are still open in this direction. But uh, what you uh, could see um, during my talk is that, um, at least for me, it's an amazing combination of very strong techniques in geometric topology. And in the end, we get geometric results because these are existence or non-existence and classification results in positive scalar curvature ge geometry. But I have to admit, this, the, the flavor of these results is much less geometric than uh, what we saw in some of the previous talks. But um, yeah, I think it's just a different perspective on our subject and it uh, shows that it's extremely rich. Okay, thank you for your attention and I would like to finish here.